Welcome to the Reinvestors Virtual Road Trip, where we are going across the country, coast to coast, interviewing real estate experts and professionals in their province, showcasing the talents they are investing in so that you, wherever you are watching from, can get more knowledge of investing in other successful markets. Yeah, everybody, we have such an incredible guest here today. Uh, he has just an unbelievable success story that we're really, really excited to share with you guys. This guy came to Canada with only 2,000 bucks in his pocket, had to work five jobs at a time. And when we first had uh, our first conversation together, he said something that was just really, really profound for me. And it was, you won or you died. And I just can't even fathom what that would be like. And I just have just mad respect for people who are in that position, who create the life of their dreams. And this is one of those guys. Uh, he's been investing for over a decade. He's a fellow Keyspire member like Randy and I, and uh, just has a variety of different investment strategies that we'll dig into a little bit here today. And so uh, everybody welcome Jet Kappenpin. And um, Jet, why don't you just start from the very beginning? from where you came to the country and, and give us the rundown on what you've been doing since, uh, since the early days. Yeah, for sure. Uh, before anything else, thanks uh, guys for having me. Really appreciate that. It's and a yeah, I, uh, I came to Canada 2006 and I was just testing the water, but I knew uh, from the very beginning that it's, this is it, right? I've seen the country and I like it. And you can be any anything you want as long as you put in the hard work. So you can have whatever you want as long as you do whatever it takes. So that's what I realized when I stepped into Canada. So after a year, uh, I had to get my, uh, my, my family, my wife and my kid. But before I was able to do that, I need to provide and prove to government that I can support my family. So I had to work for five jobs uh, for seven days, no uh, day offs, no rest day. And I started to work at five in the morning and done at one in the after, one in the morning the next day without meals in between. So in my mind, it's either I win or I die. I burn my boat behind. So there's no turning back. So uh, there's only one way uh, going forward, uh, either I, I conquer this island or I, I go back and die. So that's my only uh, options back then. So there's no, there's no backup plan. There's no going back home. This is it. Mm -hmm. And I think it kind of helped me uh, because when I started here in Winnipeg, uh, due to their Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program. So they opened the, the province for new immigrants that would like to uh, migrate to Canada. The life was not easy. I started with a slum apartment in downtown in Winnipeg. I live in the basement with my sister in the living room. She's living in the, be in the bedroom and we're kind of sharing the rent. But I, I realized that there's more in life in Canada than, than this. So I was uh, pushed hard to strive and, and get more uh, for myself. I, I was not contented to be just living in the basement in a slum apartment in downtown of Winnipeg. So I, I realized that there's something better than this and there, there must be a way. So that, my, that was my driving force. And so I got to ask before we get into some other stuff, like where does that drive of yours come from? I think uh, partly from my, from my dad because uh, I was raised with a uh, great work ethic. Uh, as my dad says, uh, if you can pee, you can work. <laughs> 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 so, all right <laughs> if you can stand up and pee then you can work so there's no there's no excuses for my dad he hates lazy people and even even me as his favorite i would say favorite son <laughs> he wakes me up at five and six in the morning and tell me that it's already late <laughs> <laughs> at five and six in the morning and you're just about to enjoy your teenage life he will just ransack the the bedroom and wakes everyone up 
and telling everyone it's too late. It's five and six in the morning. Come on, like, right? Yeah. I'm a teenager. <laughs> I need to enjoy this stuff. Yeah. But no, that's that's my upbringing. That's my orientation. So I I was raised to work hard. And if you if you need to do something, go get it. Period. Either you can make excuses or you can make it happen. Yeah, I love that. And I think all three of our pops are all kind of similar minded. They all taught us to to work hard and go, you know, design the life that we wanted and that anything was possible. Um, so, you know, with with that being said, anything being possible, walk us through the last, you know, 13 years or 14 years since you've come here, you have a successful real estate business now. You know, what type of, uh, of strategies are you, are you working in? Like what's, what's been, what, what have you been up to? Well, right now uh, we've got three deals, uh, subdivision, uh, rental, prop, rental properties, uh, which is generating monthly uh, income for us. And then we've got, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, we've got uh, foreclosure. We, we foreclose on the property uh, because we do lending as well uh to flippers like us and they were able to uh give and provide a uh, hefty uh income uh but in this case one of our flippers uh had to uh declare bankruptcy so we had to foreclose on on the property and it's a tear down which can be an apartment flat but we can uh dig and deal with the specifics uh, later on and the last one is a, a three a three-story building, 39 unit plus one commercial. Uh, we're looking at uh, purchasing it for 2.7. They're asking 3.6, but it's been in the market for an, for a year now. So I think okay. they're getting motivated now, but we'll see. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I got one more quick question before we jump in here. Like, what made you go from you know living in an apartment with your sister and not having a ton of stuff to deciding like, hey, I'm gonna go buy a bunch of real estate and build this crazy extravagant life that I always wanted. Like what, what was that transition like going from there to there? Cause that's a big jump for someone who came here with not a lot to really start getting into real estate investing. And I know a lot of people listening are saying they're like, I can't get in, but you did it with, you know, what, what you came with a, a very little and made it work. How can people that are here do that? So how did that transition look? Okay. So going back, uh, step back a little bit more. Uh, so we were renting the basement, like in the apartment block uh, in the slum area of Winnipeg. And I remember like what mentioned, I'm sharing the rent with my sister because I can't even afford the rent. It was 510, I can still remember, 510 <laughs> a month. And I can't even afford the 510. That, that how poor I was, uh, 2006. But I need to get my, uh, my wife a year after, which is 2007, October. And when she came to Canada, of course, I can't be living in the basement with my sister in the living room with my wife and my kid, right? So I was forced to look for an apartment for us or a house. And I weighed the pros and cons. I shifted my mindset instead of apartment, then I'll go with the house because of the equity and because of the privacy that it gives uh, compared to apartment where you can't do much what you like because of the tenants uh, on the other side of the wall, right? So uh, we look for a property and since we don't have much, we can't get a price that uh, we are approved of. So we were limited at that time with so little that it's a rundown property, uh, again, in downtown. So I cannot even afford a property that I, I really like. Uh, so even my sister, when, when she saw the property that we are buying, uh, she said, is this the house? <laughs> like, is this even livable by human? <laughs> so, so I was ashamed because me, New immigrant here in Canada, usually the trend is you buy the most expensive house and the nicest car you can get. <laughs> but in my case, I'm trying to buy a house for my family. It's a rundown, like not even a dog can live in that house. 
so but since we don't have money we don't have anything i don't have job i don't have car i don't have i don't know anyone like literally when i moved to canada i felt like i was naked <laughs> no job no car no one nobody no nothing no cash in the bank no nothing but when i went to the bank and i told them i don't have cash then they provided the down payment for me as well but wow. the downside is you need to get the cheapest property in town <laughs> which i did so when i went in long story short no one wants the house my family my friends were disgusted with the house like this is not a house this is not even a dog house and then they they just walk away and i was like heartbroken that time like disheartened because every time i show that property to anyone i know even my wife no one likes it <laughs> so that pushed me hard that i have no choice again i burned the boat behind i need to win or i need i need to win or i die there's no turning back there's no backup plan it's either you win or you die keep going so that's what i did so every time i get a paycheck from my five different jobs i buy a paint a kind of paint a 2 by 4s <laughs> and a raw material from from hardware stores and i do it after work so i don't have much time but i still manage to fix up the house on my own and then after a year or two uh we were on the uh like mortgage contract with the bank for 5 years but after 2 years i did the math in my head and i calculated that if we're going to stay there for 5 years like what the contract says i'll be paying more interest than the penalty that i need to pay if i go out of that contract that year on the second year hmm. so with with focus and fast forward calculations of interest that i'm going to pay to the bank i did pay the penalty of $10,000 just to get out of the contract because i remember remember there's no down payment the bank provided everything for me but i need to be there for 5 years but with the calculation i did i'll be paying more than 10,000 if i don't get out of that contract so i i bite the bullet i pay the $10,000 to the bank as a penalty for getting out of the contract earlier than the contract says and i sold the house bought another property that is a run down but i took the $10,000 penalty from the sale of the house mm. and still made a hefty profit mm. because of those renovations that i did in between yeah. my jobs so i was working around the clock and doing the renovations on the side when that happens i paid the penalty to the bank and we still made money able to do a down payment on the second house that's when the turning point was i told my wife we can do this if the first house gave us enough money to buy a second house even paying $10,000 to the bank as a penalty then what more if we learn more and what if we do this full time because i'm doing this only very part time and yet we made profit yeah that's so, a good recognition of of great opportunity exactly and so the rest was history after the second house then we just keep doing the same thing but the second house uh instead of selling it we realize why sell if we can keep it mm. right because the first one we had to sell because we need to pay the bank's penalty and then put the down payment on the second house but the second house we're now in a better position 
and we are not paying any penalty anymore on the second house. So we decided let's keep the second house as a rental and then do it again and do it again and do it again. So fast forward from 2013, we started 2006 renting. Then 2013, when we started corporate or incorporating the, the business, uh, we now have 14, excuse me, 14 doors. Hmm. Wow. So from, from $2,000 in my pocket that can barely afford anything because I don't have a car. I need to buy a car. I need to find <laughs> jobs. I need to eat. I need to support my family. And I need to pay uh, one month rent and half month deposit in Winnipeg. $2,000 is nothing. Okay. I can't yeah. even afford to buy my shoes and my pants. But fast forward 14 doors, it is not easy. No one said it's easy, but it's doable. Mm. Yeah, and that story is so incredible and inspiring in so many ways and just makes me like realize like, oh man, sitting at home watching Netflix is such a luxury for, for so many of us uh, that, yeah. that maybe you didn't quite get that luxury coming here because you had to, you know, like you said, burn the boats and, and get over here. So absolutely incredible i want to i want to switch a little bit and talk a little bit about the market that you're in so obviously you're in winnipeg manitoba and uh, we're all kind of just joking before we hopped on this call of like apparently in winnipeg it's like you're in, in manitoba it's like you know winnipeg of seven hundred thousand people and then you go outside that and it's like small town you know forty thousand people in any community right. so it's very um you know hard to work in those areas so winnipeg is like the place tell us a little bit about the market you know what it what is the demographics there, what's the industries look like, rents, things like that? Well, the Win Winnipeg, it nice about Winnipeg is it's flat. You, <laughs> you can see, you can see end to end. And the best part is you can be anywhere from point A to point B in less than half an hour. Whoa. So anywhere, as in literally anywhere. So I, if you are not, if you are not sure where is the place, you can always say, I'll be there in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> because it's half an hour or less. Uh, that's the beauty of Winnipeg. And then second is immigration is open. So mm -hmm. that means uh, people are coming to Winnipeg on a daily basis. So what does that translate as an investor? That means these people will be looking for houses. These, these people will be looking for apartments. These people will need a roof on their head. So there's always opportunity. And uh, we all know uh, now with, even with the COVID-19, apartment blocks, multiplexes are recession proof. People would lose their job. People would lose their uh, anything that they would like to do while the economy is booming, but when the recession hit or when the economy is not doing great, people still need a roof on their head and people still need to stay inside their house. So apartment is booming actually uh, in COVID-19. Yeah. More than, more than ever, I would say, and not everyone is being approved by the bank. So that's another good with, with uh, Manitoba or in Winnipeg because the immigration provincial nominee program, uh, people are coming here. And then third, the affordability is super affordable. Uh, you can buy a house uh, in Winnipeg for less than 100. And the average is between 250 to 320. But that's not that's a nice house, and from from two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty, that is like a nice uh, luxury house, if you would say. But you could still buy hundred fifty to uh, two hundred thousand, and then flip it. And ARV could be uh, thirty to forty percent of that. Wow! And then the cap rate, I would say between 6.5 to 8.5. Uh, but if you hit the jackpot, uh, you are looking at between 10 to 13% cap rate. 
So yes. the affordability is there, but the the monthly uh, rent is almost the same as like the rest of the Canada. What what are you seeing for rents there? So kind of just walk us through like a uh, let's just talk apartments, but like a one bedroom and a two bedroom in an apartment right now. One bedroom or two bedroom apartment. Like right now, uh, we have the subdivision that we are renting. It's a two bedroom in St. James. St. James is just beside the Polo Park Mall. It's yep. just own throw away from the mall, and it's a nice area, most desired area, and we are renting it uh, for thirteen hundred a month. Oh wow! So that's two two bedroom. If you got three bedroom, you could you could uh, probably ask for fifteen hundred to sixteen hundred a month, and uh, I have a four bedroom apartment uh, that I'm renting nineteen hundred a month. Wow, those are really good numbers. It Excellent is. numbers, yeah. So the the nineteen hundred a month, we just bought it for eighty five thousand. Wow! Wow, <laughs> that's insane. It is insane. That's real so good. It's good to be in Winnipeg in this time yeah i uh, I have a friend of mine who moved to winnipeg from victoria um probably like three years ago now and she took she uh, her and her family lived in a townhouse here that was worth maybe like 450 or so uh she had a little bit of equity in it took her husband and, and two kids moved i can't remember what the town was but it was about an hour west of uh winnipeg and bought a like, rural little town sold her place made a couple hundred k i think off the the place here in victoria and bought a mid 1900s um, house. Needed a little bit of fixing up, but nice yard, like a couple acres, I think, on a on a farm type land. And she bought the house for 17 grand. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I was like, you guys are made. That that that's awesome because uh, I know uh, personally uh, from the local investors, he got the house for 25 thousand. Wow. So me buying the 85,000, I'm not even close to it. Uh, but there, you could still get uh, 25,000, 30,000 uh, dollar property. Sure. You just need to find it. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. So it sounds like the buy and hold strategy obviously is working really well out there for you. And um, you've done some flips along the way, or have you guys sold any of the properties? Like, is flipping a strategy? I guess I'll ask like, what strategies are working best for you out there? and making the most sense for you guys to invest? There are tons of uh, investors in, in Winnipeg now. And like what uh, my friends here saying that they are moving from uh, Toronto and Vancouver because of the affordability. Uh, one is uh, they, they moved from Kelowna and he's saying that uh, he could buy three houses here compared to one in, in, in BC, uh, but breaking almost, almost the same amount in terms of rent. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's kind of crazy thing, but it's happening. And especially now with COVID-19 uh, in, in Winnipeg, there's, I, I, I'm not happy, but, it is the reality that people lost their jobs and that's another reason why so many homeowners are starting to consider selling their house, right? Because they could not uh, afford to carry it anymore. Uh, it's unfortunate and I feel the, I feel the pain. Uh, I've been there, I've, I've experienced uh, these things, but again, uh, it's the reality and we're all going in this together. Uh, it's a cycle, but if you are prepared and you are equipped and you have uh, learned how to do these things properly and ethically, people can make opportunities and create wealth in, in this time of COVID-19. Totally. That's uh such a great thing. And um, just one last quick question before Steve jumps into the next section here is like, what do um, apartment buildings look like there? I know you said you were looking at an apartment building. Um, obviously, single family homes are working great for you. Um, is, and you're talking, you know, eight to 10% cap rates. That's a not common theme that we hear in the industry. You know, we talk in three and a half to four and a half cap rates over here in BC. So 
is that like, are the apartment buildings really run down and gross and take a lot of work? Are they in good shape? Are you know, like, like for someone like myself, I'm like, why don't you just buy everything that's an 8% cap rate over there? Is there lots of them? What does that look like? Yeah. The, the beauty of uh, Winnipeg is because there's pockets of properties that you need to know as an investor, there's always red zone, right? So as soon as you, you see that uh, red zone or you're aware that there's a red zone, now you kind of pick your, uh, your properties. You just don't buy everything, right? Because you could probably pick up like 17 grand or $25,000 uh, property, but uh, after flipping it, then what, right? So yeah. who's, your, who's your market? Who's your audience? Who's your tenant? Who's your buyer? So you need to think uh, ahead, like begin with an end in mind. And from there, you could decide uh, and, and focus on the geographical location that you are targeting on which property you're going to buy. Uh, and you can, you can get help from local realtors uh, by doing that uh, kind of cherry picking your property that you want to uh, invest and grow your portfolio with. Uh, because if you buy every single uh, cheap houses out there and you don't know the, the, the demographics and you don't know the, uh, the outcome after your flip or your burr or whatever your strategy is or your approach, then you'll be stuck with that property. So you need to work with someone local, like a realtor or mortgage broker. Uh, they know all these numbers, they know all the red zones. And when you got all this information and then you have the bigger picture, then you can actually uh, focus uh, which area you can just buy and then uh, you just stay there. You don't, you don't go on everywhere. And then I think as an investor, you also need to uh, streamline your process, not just buy everywhere because in terms of maintenance and uh, managing your property, it's going to be a chaos, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Great points there too. And <clears throat> I do want to have a, a couple minutes here where we talk about uh, one of the deals that you mentioned, and you mentioned three at the beginning of this call, but I kind of want to just focus on one of them, which is the subdiv uh, subdivision that you're doing. And so uh, I, I loved part of the strategy that you said, and I'm not going to spoil it because I want you to I want you to talk about it. But start at the beginning and tell us how you found that property, and then what's your strategy on it now? Okay, so this is the subdivision, right? Yeah. Yeah. The subdivision. Uh, since we've been working with uh, local realtors. What, what, how we do it is we, we contact realtors that have the most sales in town because if this realtor uh, is selling more houses than anyone else, he must be good. <laughs> so, so deal with him. And once you establish and build relationship with this uh, realtor, uh, they always have a pocket listing. Yeah. So pocket listing, that's what I love because before they even bring it to the market, they call me. That's so perfect. That, that's when you make the, uh, that's where you create the opportunities uh, because you don't, you don't line up with everyone else. You, you talk to your realtor one-on-one -on -one when they have the pocket listing that no one ever knew about. Because when you are looking at properties on the MLS, most chances are blown out anyway. And uh, chances are it's been seen by everyone. So I love packet listing. So I got, I got the subdivision from packet listing and we bought it from the realtor. And the technique that we did is uh, to make it legal because she, the realtor was contacted by the homeowner and as soon as he got it under contract with the homeowner, he contacted us and we were the first one to see the property. And then as soon as we purchased the property, then he listed it in MLS. <laughs> so, 
So I, I, it's kind of uh, like a minute apart. So he listed it in MLS. <laughs> and then after a minute, we signed the contract that we purchased. <laughs> so that's how you, uh, but this is like takes time to build relationship with realtors because when you can pull the trigger, realtor knows that you're a no nonsense person. Yeah. So when, when realtor brings you deal and you pull the trigger, you purchase it right away, then he will constantly and always contacting you when the good deal comes along. Right. So he listed it. And after a minute, we purchase it with, from him. And then, uh, from there, uh, we've been working with the city uh, to subdivide and split the lot. And like yesterday, we just received the green light from the city and the hydro that the easement plan and the subdivision is approved. And now we're just uh, canvassing and getting quotes from, from the builders. Nice. That's awesome. And so there's a house already on it. You're cutting mm -hmm. it in half probably to build another house. Is the house that's on it, is that covering all your costs? Yes. So the house uh, is currently rented for 1300 a month. It's a two bedroom house and it's sitting on the half of the lot because it's a 50 foot, 50 foot frontage uh, property. Uh, by law, minimum is 25 foot lot yeah. to, to build the house on it. So this house is perfectly sitting on the other half of the lot. Nice. So when we split the lot, then now we have a 25 foot spare lot. So now we can build on that 25 foot lot and uh, it would be an infill. So that's where we are trying to uh, raise money now. Uh, the cost that we're looking at is between 220 to 240. The ARV is between 360 to 380, uh, depending on the timing on the market. Once yeah, said and done. Those are some, some excellent numbers as well. Um, mm -hmm. Through this process of, you know, going through and subdividing and raising capital and, you know, the actual construction and sale, um, what would you say the hardest part of this deal is going to be for you? Uh, you mean for the subdivision? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the hardest part would be because uh, it's always unknown when you're starting a project, uh, even though you've done it multiple times, there's always uh, variables that you need to prepare for. Uh, like now, uh, we're doing infill in the middle of this pandemic. So we don't know what would be the effect in terms of pricing because not everyone can afford to purchase houses now and not everyone gets approved uh, to purchase this, uh, this new infill in town. So those are the things that we need to prepare for. And, uh, but as early as now, even we haven't started yet, we are uh, trying to mitigate all this risk associated to this uh, project of subdividing the, uh, the property and building a new infill. But I think the hardest part uh, is the construction because that's where you need to hire a the right contractor so you don't need to babysit your tradespeople you don't need mm -hmm. to be there 24 by 7. Uh, you just need the, to manage the contractor and the contractor manages the team that doing the building right so because you only have so much time and you only have two hands so if you are going to babysit the carpenter, the electrician, the plumber, then it's not, it's not a scalable business model. Then might as well uh, get yourself a job. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We know, we know all about managing uh, contractors. We're doing a lot of that now on some, exactly. of, our, some of our renovations. And it's uh, when you get a good team, it really makes all the difference in the world for new renovations and everyone working together. It's, uh, it's a huge, huge benefit. So. Right. Glad you brought that point up. Um, shifting gears here one more time. Um, you've done quite a few deals now, obviously, and uh, we we're just chatting offline. You mentioned that you know you you went through buying all these properties, then got stuck because you know you hit that that 
portfolio that a lot of people do where they can't go purchase anymore personally. And you have to start bringing in partners or outside capital and stuff. Um, just quickly, you know, a, a quick two minute summary. How was that transition for you? And what were some of the adjustments you had to make from going from maxed out your portfolio into joint venturing and the different worlds that that's brought you into? Well, uh, like everyone else uh, been experiencing, when you get that uh, four or five properties under your portfolio, under your belt, uh, the bank starts to hold back and uh, arrange a meeting with you uh, that they can do more properties for you uh, because I, I, I realized that the bank would also need to protect themselves, right? Because you're now yeah. over leveraging themselves and yourself as well. Uh, so at the end of the day, the bank is there to, to make business. They're, they're not there to, to grow investors, right? They're, they're yeah. there to make business and they need to ensure that their, their funds are secured and you can pay them in case of uh, something goes south. So uh, it only depends on the bank if they allow four or five, but I hope that would change eventually. But that's where my, my turning point when the bank says, no, you can't buy more properties under your name. So that's also when we started to do uh, incorporation. Mm. So I can't, I can't buy more properties under my name, but probably I can buy more properties under my corporation. <laughs> So, exactly. That's why you always need to think if there's a roadblock, what can I do to go around or work around or go up, do whatever you do and do whatever you need to uh, dig under that roadblock or go around or go up, right? But don't stop on, at the roadblock. There's nothing in there. You need to keep going. So, that's when uh, I need to think uh, creatively. Uh, okay, I can't buy more properties under my name. What if, what if I, I make my own corporation, then I can buy more. If I partner with, uh, with same or like-minded people, then I can buy more. So that's when it started to, uh, now we need to expand our wings. We need to think outside of the box. It's no longer under my name it's now under corporation name it's now under jv partnership and that's when the things getting more uh exciting because uh now you're not relying on yourself uh you probably have done it so many times but other investors have different set of skills as well that you've never had before right so People can put more skills on the table than just by you, by yourself, right? So with, with more people coming together, uh, then the, the winnings are multiplied and the risks are divided. So that's when we started doing JV partnership, uh, left, right, and center, because uh, now we realize that, okay, we need to uh, move forward, but we have to do it differently than the way we were doing it before. So the bank only makes you think smarter. That's they, cool. they, yeah, they tell you, you can't do it, but don't stop there. You have to go past it. Yeah, I love what you're saying about having to, to when you hit that roadblock, just pivot and move and not just get stopped. And uh, I think that's kind of been your your motto from the day that you got over here, from the day mm -hmm. you're born of just, you know, there is no roadblocks. It's just finding a new way around it. So absolutely love hearing that. And that's such a, I know there's a lot of people that are in that situation now where they're tapped out on, on able to buy properties and having to shift into the joint venture world. And Steve and I always say we'd rather have a small percentage of something than a hundred percent of nothing. And so exactly. that means bring in some partners to grow the portfolio and just keep taking chunks and chunks and chunks. And that's what we have to do to make sure we keep ensuring that we got more revenue coming back in. So we're, uh, we're going to jump into some quick rapid fire questions here for you. So people can get to know you a little bit and uh, get to okay. learn a few of the questions. Are you ready? Sure. That's uh, cool. Let's do it. What's one thing every visitor needs to see in your market? Multiplexes. Yeah. <laughs> 
I love it. <laughs> what is a, uh, a local business that you want to give a shout out to? Local business, I would like to shout out to uh, the, right now, the cleaning companies because they are doing awesome work. Every time we do flip, uh, they are the ones working behind the scene. So mm-hmm. everyone is praising us investors when we are selling properties and when everything is said and done. But these are the people that working hard when after all your projects, they do all the cleaning. And I think they are the unsung heroes. <laughs> so I pick up the phone and sometimes I only give them an hour or two notice. And then they show up with all the crew and their brooms and cleaning materials. <laughs> Bam, then tomorrow selling time. Right. Awesome. That's a great shout out for sure. If you could have a fireside chat with anybody, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, Warren Buffett. Nice. And uh, Brandon Turner. Those two mm. people. Right on. Good, good selections. I'd love to have a dinner or coffee with those guys. <laughs> yeah. I would um, pay to have them on my table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Uh, what is your favorite real estate related book or resource? Uh, it was Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. That was the turning point, 180 degrees when I was uh, working uh, back home in the Philippines. But now uh, I've read The Everyday uh, Real Estate Investors by Paul M. Heck. Uh, he's one of the key spire uh, speakers and he wrote a book and with that it's another uh, favorite of mine unreal we're gonna do a few would you rather questions would you rather have great partners but bad tenants or great tenants with bad partners i would rather have great partners with bad tenants because at the end of the day when you have great partners you can always work with them to turn around the situation but if you have great tenants and bad partners there's no nothing you can do uh, it would cost you uh, so much frustrations and and time and money with the partner not being on your side and not having the same uh, mi- mindset or mentality with you uh, because your tenant you're not working with them they're just renting your your business and they can, they can move out anytime they want or you want. But your partner, I treat my partners, my JV partners, as a long-term relationship. Mm-hmm. Would you rather have the headache of 10 different partners on 10 different properties or only one partner and only six properties? I would rather have uh, like 10 partners and 10 properties uh, because that way you learn more in in my experience uh, you never lose either you win or you learn Mm -hmm. if you lose don't lose the lesson because that's the only time you lose when you lose and you lose the lesson but when you lose and you learn something from it that's another education that you just paid for and you will be coming out stronger and better after that lesson. So you never lose. Either you win or you learn. And then don't lose the lesson. <laughs> That's great. Um, now, if anyone here, would you rather not have a phone for an entire year and get asleep inside or have your phone for the entire year but have to sleep outside in a tent? I would rather have my phone and sleeping outside of the tent. <laughs> <laughs> even because, even uh, in those winters, eh? Because as what I mentioned my, to my wife, uh, my phone is worth $3 million. Mm. Because all my contacts and my lenders, my investors, my JV partners, and my opportunities are in my phone. Mm-hmm. So even we are five kilometers uh, driving on the road, and it would take me like 20 minutes to go back to my house just to get my phone, I would do it. Because, <laughs> uh, sometimes a single phone call would make a difference in terms of creating opportunity. 
Yeah. So yeah. It's crazy how dependent we've become on just a, a little device that, you know, rewinding 10 years didn't have any real effect on us in, in a lot of ways. But um, Jet, this has just been a really great conversation. I super appreciate your time, man. Uh, you have such a great story, you know, great success through real estate. And I, I know a lot of people are going to learn a lot from, uh, from what we've talked about over this last little bit. And, you know, even if they're a, a high level expert in, investor, in investing, they're still going to get a lot of inspiration and motivation from your story and just everything that you've shared so far. So, um, you know, if people do want to get in, t- in contact with you, what's the best way that they can do that? Uh, through the uh, company website, we have leadingproperties.ca. Uh, so we can receive uh, messages from there. Uh, we can get email from there. So that's also our landing page for anyone who would like to partner with us or anyone that would like uh, to sell their house to us and everyone that uh, would like to lend money uh, for our projects. Uh, that's our landing page. And that's when, where can we get uh, contacted from uh, leadingproperties.ca. Perfect. And uh, we'll, we'll include that in some of the show notes here. So people have an automatic, you know, easy access to that. Um, and if this is your guys' first, you know, first episode, we're doing this entire series going from BC all the way to the East Coast and talking to, you know, more and more experts uh, in different cities and learning about different strategies that work. You know, we learned a lot about just how incredible cap rates can be in Winnipeg just in this mm-hmm. conversation alone. And so if you do want to be a part of this conversation and, and get to know uh, more experts and investors from across the country, get to know more markets, we just want to invite you to join our reinvestor community on Facebook super easy. All you have to do is jump into Facebook, search up the reinvestors community. You'll find our private group. All of, uh, all of our videos are are published there first. So you guys can get first access into that. Lots of really cool trainings, lots of other conversations and panels and stuff that we do. Lots of great communication, lots of people from all across the country. Uh, so we invite you to join in on that. And with that being said, I just want to thank you for watching this interview with Jet. Uh, join us on our next episode as we continue to interview real estate experts across Canada and learn about what strategies work and where. So, Jet, thank you so much for your time, my friend. Thanks, guys, for having me. And again, I wish all the luck and all successes to you both. Thank you so much, my friend. Right, Right back at you.